You don't have a seat, Mr. Tisdale is present. Council are present, the jury is not recorded. Uh, Jury, <clears throat> come in. Seldon, are you ready to have them come in? Yes, sir. State ready to have the jury come in? Yes, sir, you are. You're right. please. Okay, thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, thank thank you. you for bearing with us. Uh, we're going to push ahead. Now, again, I, I haven't mentioned it, but if any of y'all need to use the restroom or anything while we're proceeding, don't be bashful. Let Mr. Vaughn or Mr. Riles know. Ordinarily, I know it's none of my business, but I don't want to show they're uncomfortable. So if anybody needs the restroom, you got to go, you got to go. So please let us know, okay? Okay, Mr. Seldonio, when you're ready. Thank you. Same goes for you, Dr. Cunningham. If yes, you, sir. Appreciate please it. Please tell me. Thank uh, you, sir. If you tell me, I won't know. Okay, Doctor, we're going to pick up where we left off. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, you have the clicker over there? I do. Okay, now, um, can we, in taking into consideration the risk assessment techniques, um, what is the first factor that you utilize when pointing to your well, you, you, Yes, ma'am, and I'm going to be focusing on those top two techniques in the testimony that follows. Okay. Uh, the first factor is that he is age 28 into the Florida Department of Corrections and would be 28 if sentenced to life at entrance into Florida DOC. Okay, and how does age relate to his conduct of violence? Well, age is uh, one of the most powerful predictive factors uh, in terms of prison misconduct and prison violence. Very simply, the older the inmate is in prison, or the older the inmate is as he, enter, he or she enters prison, the dramatically less likely misconduct of any severity is and the dramatically less likely violence is in prison. And so it's not unlike, again, what we observe in drivers, that as the driver ages, particularly from 16 to 25 to 35, the incidence of speeding tickets, 
and accidents go down pretty steeply, which is why your insurance rates drop like that as well. And to illustrate that, uh, in this first slide, this is slide seven, this is a study of over 33,000 inmates that I did with Ada Paul Kunliang and John Sorensen. And to understand this graph, the, the, how often the misconduct is occurring is on this vertical axis. And if I could, if I could stand up and go to the screen. Of course. So how often it happens is here on this vertical axis. Here, okay, it's, it's in touch screen. Oh. You just... <laughs> Sorry, let me back up. I'll, I'll motion at it as not touch. All right, so how often the misconduct is occurring is here on this axis. So the higher that line is, the more misconduct's occurring. And how old the inmates are is across the bottom of this. 13 to 17, 18 to 20, 21 to 35, 21 well, to 20. There you go again. Oh, I'll step back. <laughs> and so on. Uh, the green line reflects age 28 on this chart. Which is the reflection of, of Eris? The age of Eris Tisdale okay. uh, at this time. Okay. Now we have four different severities of misconduct on this chart. The top line, well actually it's this line, are total infractions. <laughs> And then there's potential violence. All assaults is yellow. Assaults with injury is this kind of turquoise line. And then the purple line is assaults with serious injuries. Now, to explain this chart just a little bit more, the, the frequency of getting a disciplinary ticket is very, very common. So that about 50% of inmates, about 35% of homicide offenders, will get a disciplinary ticket for something in prison each year. On the other hand, the frequency of, of, of assaults with serious injury is extremely rare. That's maybe in Florida, one in 500 inmates a year. And so what we've done is we've compressed this chart because if it actually reflected that difference, the graph would be taller than the ceiling because those, uh, those tickets are happening 100 times more often than the, the assaults with serious injury. So we've just compressed this thing so you can see all the lines on the same graph. Uh, and what you observe, independent of the severity of the misconduct that we're talking about, is that line slopes down from the left down to the right. In other words, the older the inmate is, whatever severity of misconduct we're talking about, it becomes steadily less likely as the inmate ages. And again, this is over 33,000 inmates in the Florida Department of Corrections. And in this slide, we're looking at their conduct. Uh, they're averaging about two and a half years in prison, two and a half to three years, as we're looking at those 33,000. Okay, now, Dr. Arden, your studies that you conducted and the research that you uh, applied to, to make this presentation, the slide, does it go across the board to all different states are involved in the study? It's not just... Florida, right? Oh, yes, ma'am. This is, again, one of the most clearly established principles in penology or prison science, that the older the inmate is, the less likely violence is to occur. And even though we might think of someone who's 28 years old as still being relatively young, you can observe how much lower their rates of misconduct are than the inmates that are 8 to 10 years younger, or even the inmates that are 21 to 25 that already we've gotten a lot of reduction by the time somebody is 28 years old. Now, this is the same thing that the, uh, the automobile casualty industry shows. That's why the, the car rental companies won't rent a car to a, a male who's less than 25. Because they also get this notion that by the time you get out to 25, you're at a much lower risk than the guys are who are even just a few years younger than that. Now, the nature of science is that rather than taking the results of just one state, you identify whether it generalizes. You look at what happens in other states to see how reliable this finding is. Okay, did you do that? Yes, ma'am. This is a, a research that I did with Dr. John Sorensen and Dr. Tom Reedy in the Oregon Department of Corrections. This is based on over 33,000 inmates in Oregon. And we're looking at the same thing. On the vertical axis, that's how often the misconduct occurs. 
and across this horizontal axis, that's the age of the inmate at admission to prison. Now that's important because that means that even though this person did their offense when they were a little older, still when they got to prison, they had the benefit of that aging effect. And so in this case, uh, we're looking at level one infractions, assaults, or serious violent acts. And regardless of, of that severity, the older the individual is, the less likely those are to occur. And the blue line is at about age 28, where Eris Tisdale would be. Uh, this is another uh, data set out of Oregon. Again, the, the blue line is where Eris Tisdale would fall. I just can't even come near that. Uh, the vertical axis, how often it happens, horizontal axis, age of the inmate. And again, you see how steeply this falls from the late teens here to 26, 28, and then continues to fall until uh, we get out here to about age 50. And then it kind of planes out. And this is still based on age in your research? Yes, ma'am. This is based on 17,000 inmates. This study was not one that I published. This was uh, based on the doctoral dissertation, which is the scientific project somebody does uh, in gaining a doctorate degree. Uh, this is research that he did for his dissertation. Well, what about people that are um, convicted of capital crimes? Good question. So these are looking at inmates, all inmates. So now the question is, does this aging factor apply to people who have committed murders or even capital murder? So this is a study that I did with Dr. John uh, Sorensen and Dr. Tom Reedy where we looked at 145 federal capital inmates. Those are individuals that were charged with death penalty eligible crimes in federal court. And then they were either allowed to plead to life without parole or their juries sentenced them to life without parole instead of the death penalty. We identified 145 of those federal capital offenders who were sentenced to life without parole and we're tracking them across averaging about six years in prison. Now obviously that's not a lifetime in prison, but the research tells us that if serious violence is going to occur with an inmate, you're likely to see evidence of that in the first three to five years. And the longer that somebody goes without that violence, the much less likely it is to occur because they're establishing a pattern of nonviolence. It's kind of like if somebody's been driving for six years and they haven't gotten a ticket yet for doing 90 in a 30, it's unlikely that they're going to get that kind of ticket now. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but based on that track record, you're not so likely to see it. And this time we're looking at potential violence. That's assaults of any severity, uh, threats against staff, weapons contraband, that kind of thing. Assaultive infractions and serious assaults. The green dotted line is age 28, where Eris Tisdale is, and you see the same line that you do looking at all inmates. And again, this is their age at conviction. So even though this person committed their offense when they were older, they committed this capital offense when they're older. So you might say, well wait, aging doesn't apply to this guy, because you would also see a decreased incidence with age out in the community. Well, he's kind of defying that. He committed this even though he's older. Well, intuitively that might make sense, but the nature of science isn't to do things intuitively. It's, well, a scientist wants to know how many teeth does a horse have. He doesn't say, well, how many teeth does a horse need to have to chew its diet? It's not intuitive. Instead, the, the scientist looks in the horse's mouth and counts the teeth. And so if we want to know, does this aging factor apply in capital murderers, then we would look at capital murderers and study how disciplinary infractions occur in relationship to their age. And what we find is even though they committed this offense in an older age, even so, they're showing the same age-related uh, decrease in misconduct, just like all the other prison inmates do. Regardless of the crime? Regardless of, you know, the, part of what this demonstrates, again, is, that in this case, the, uh, the, the strength of age is a factor in reducing likelihood of, of violence. And also this, this line here that shows you the very low rate of serious violence in prison, that tells you that the seriousness of the offense is not predictive of serious violence in prison. And we'll see more research that follows up on that 
a conclusion. Okay, now when the next factor you go into, which is the disciplinary infractions? Yes, ma'am, this is the... It, wait, let me ask a question. Sure. Does it matter if the, the person only has a prior history of jail versus prison? Does it come into play? Well, yeah, when we look at this pattern, so our, our next factor is, uh, is this past pattern, that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Now remember, that holds if you have enough behavior to form a pattern and your context of prediction is sufficiently similar. Well, the similar context is in custody. And so we're very interested in a defendant's behavior in custody in jail and also in custody in prison, because those are our context of greatest similarity. Now your question was, even though he's in custody, he's not in prison custody. And so can we use jail custody to help inform this past pattern? And the answer is yes. Jail, in fact, is a more difficult place to do time than prison is. because is that? Because jail is not designed for long-term confinement. It's intended for short-term confinement uh, as somebody first comes in and cycles back into prison on a parole violation or is awaiting trial, as opposed to prison, which is equipped to hold people for years and decades at a time. And so in prison, there are, there's programming and work and activities and that sort of thing to constructively occupy individuals. There are typically not those kinds of programming that are available in a jail setting. And then also in jail, you have people that are coming in fresh off the streets with fresh mental health issues, with fresh, fresh substance abuse problems, with the stress of arrest and facing conviction and that kind of thing. And so they are coming in in a less stable and more volatile sort of way. And then the existing people are having to continually prove themselves as that mix in custody changes. Uh, as opposed to prison, that is designed for long-term stay. There are activities, and there's a more stable social mix as well, that folks have figured out who they are and then can move along in a more stable direction. Okay, and what is the predictive relevance for Eris about well, future risk? He's been in jail, uh, pretrial in this case, for over two years, and then he had about nine months in jail custody previously. Uh, only minor disciplinary infractions in the last uh, two and a half, two years, and no pattern of violence in his prior custody. And so that's establishing a pattern in custody that points to his having a lower likelihood of serious violence in prison. Okay, now is that subjective when it comes to no pattern of violence in prior custody? Well, it's reviewed a, the records, right? I, re I reviewed the records. So the, the, his disciplinary history uh, on this day in the prior custody is what it is. Right. Uh, the interpretation of that uh, is uh, is somewhat subjective. It's based on the research right. in this area. Right, but he had that prior assault in 2010 while he was incarcerated on, on one of the corrections officers. And how do you associate that with no pattern of violence in prior custody? Well, the, the key word here is no pattern. Not that there wasn't anything at all, but no pattern. And then you would go back and look at what that involved. And the description of that, that uh, uh, jail assault in 2010 uh, was, uh, as I recall, his being asked to cuff up or to come to the uh, door, and he grabbed a cake and opened it, a little cake package, and started eating it. Uh, because he didn't immediately comply and instead grabbed a little cake to eat, he was then cuffed, and uh, in his when, after he was cuffed, he kind of tossed the wrapper at the correctional officer. Well, the officer then took him down to the floor. And in the process of taking him down to the floor, uh, I think another officer uh, got involved as well. As he struggled in that process, they called that an assault between the wrapper and then taking him down to the floor. And so this wasn't a, this wasn't a predatory assault on a corrections officer. It wasn't like you let him walk by and then you blindsided him or, or tried to uh, strike the officer with a weapon or that kind of thing. Uh, and so it's important to look at the context of that and whether that is a pattern of other aggression, physical aggression towards staff or inmates or whether that stands in isolation. And so because that stands in isolation, 
uh, and does not reflect a predatory kind of assault. I give that relatively low credence in terms of this uh, pattern, except to the extent that the minor disciplinary infractions involve his being mouthy uh, and talking louder when he's told to be quiet or not immediately complying with an instruction. Uh, that kind of thing. Because there are several of those, that tells us we can probably expect more of that from Eris Tisdale. That he may well uh, uh, be verbally belligerent, uh, talk ugly in some way, but is simply not followed up by physical aggression towards staff uh, or other inmates. Okay. And they would have consequences for that. That's correct. That's correct. That's one of the, one of the features of, of jail custody and prison custody is the immediate application of consequences that make your time in custody less pleasant. Okay. And why don't we go to the next factor? Uh, the next factor is education. He has a high school diploma and also has an associate's uh, degree. And this is also a factor that's, that we can understand the meaning of by looking at research at rates of violence depending on what education the person has. The first study that informs this uh, is one that was uh, published by Miles Hare, or the authors are Miles Hare and Neil Langan. It was published in a scientific journal, Crime and Delinquency. Uh, Miles Hare is a researcher in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And this is a study that's based on over 100,000 inmates. And what they found from this study is that inmates who've earned a high school diploma or GED have lower rates of violence in prison. And they're reporting that uh, 14 years ago in 2001. Uh, we've identified this same feature in the research that we've done, the large-scale research that we've done as well. And let me illustrate that with one of the studies that reflects this. And that is over how long a period of time? Uh, this study is over an 11-year period of time. We looked at these inmates in a high-security prison in Missouri called the Potosi Correctional Center. And we looked at these inmates, uh, tracked them from 1991 to 2002. So we're looking at this, these guys. They're side by side with each other in the same institution over the same decade. Now, this is a, uh, what you see here is a table that reflects the results of a reduced logistic regression model. Now, logistic regression is a statistical technique that lets you hold all other factors constant so you can study the effect that a single factor has. And so as we look at one of the factors we studied here, more than 12 years of education, and track this across, this last column, this exponent B, is, uh, reflects an odds ratio. Okay, doctor. Is is that the highlighted line you're at? Is that where Eric Sisna would fall? Yes, ma'am. He would be in that group that has GED, high school diploma, at least 12 years or equivalent of education. And, and what we see under the odds ratio is 0 0.561. That means that holding all other factors constant, the guys that have this amount of education only have 56% of the likelihood of being involved in assaultive misconduct as the other guys they're side by side with. In other words, that factor alone cuts their risk in half. <clears throat> now we can see another feature here, which is if they're serving a life sentence, 0.496, they are half as likely to be involved in violent misconduct in prison, holding all other factors constant. Now what, can we explain a little further on that? Um, Somebody that's serving a life sentence is half as likely to be violent in prison, and then he went to another factor. Well, there, there, there are an interesting feature about this research, an interesting feature about Potosi that also goes to the seriousness of the offense, and one of the reasons why we were studying this prison is that Missouri has been mainstreaming their death-sentenced inmates since 1991. In other words, rather than keeping their death-sentenced inmates on a segregated death row, they have been mixing them in the general prison population. So a death-sentenced inmate is celled with a non-death inmate on, a un on a units with non-death inmates, out on the yard with non-death inmates, in contact visitation, on jobs and programming with non-death inmates. They treat them just like other inmates rather than segregating them, isolating them because of their sentence. Okay, 
Now, they were pleased with that experience over the decade, but no one had ever gone in to study the assault rates uh, that these guys had, the descendants guys, as compared to the people they were side by side with. And as we did that, we found that those descendants inmates who are mainstream, they're half as likely to be involved in violent misconduct as the parole eligible inmates they're side by side with. They look just like the guys serving life without parole. And so even being under a sentence of death was not predictive okay. of violence in prison. And that was in Missouri, though. They don't fall that concept in Florida State Prison. That's correct. In Florida, they are uh, they're, they're locked down. Okay. Why well, don't we get to the next batch and we'll consider in seeing whether or not Eris can make a positive adjustment to life without parole. The next factor is continued contact with community members. And this is based on research demonstrating that inmates who have family or friends visiting them or who they're in telephone contact with have better prison adjustments than inmates who are not having the benefit of that. And did Eric have that? Yes, he does. Here in jail, his mom uh, uh, visits, uh, comes with his son monthly, and they speak by phone two or three times a week, corresponds with Jessica, a girlfriend, and Lauren Tyre, a cousin, he speaks to by phone about twice a week. And so he does have continuing community contact. As we best understand it, the, 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 the reason why this, this serves to reduce uh, prison misconduct is that visitation and phone contact are an incentive that the inmates want to maintain. And if they get in trouble, that's taken away. Uh, and then there may be some thought that that continued contact with community members helps keep them anchored to community values and that they don't want to have to explain to their family, you can't come see me now for six months because I've been acting out in custody. What would be the next factor you consider? Uh, the next factor is that he has been convicted of capital murder. Okay, and how does that um, help us in our statistics? Well, this is an example of, of what I would, would uh, characterize as uh, a profoundly counterintuitive finding. Counterintuitive means it's the opposite of what you would think. You would think that somebody who has committed the worst offense in the community would end up being the greatest risk of violence in prison having already committed this offense and whatever that has to say about their, their personality or values or that kind of thing. And so this is, a, I guess, to illustrate kind of t uh, intuitive, counterintuitive, it is intuitively obvious when you look out the window that the world is flat. It's intuitively obvious. So much so that that's what people thought for thousands of years. And obviously, the sun is going around the earth, which is stationary. That's intuitively obvious, and again, that's what people thought for many thousands of years. Now, the reality is, is the sun is staying still and the earth is turning, and also going in an orbit around the, the, the sun, and that the earth is round, or nearly so. Now, we only learned that, though, by the application of science, because our common sense told us that the world was flat. Now, this is a similar sort of thing that that science tells us something different about the behavior of capital offenders in prison than we might intuitively think. To illustrate that, uh, this is a study that, uh, that I did with uh, Dr. John Sorensen, Dr. Mark Began, and S.O. Woods, published in Criminal Justice and Behavior, a leading uh, peer-reviewed uh, forensic psychology and, and criminal justice uh, publication. And in this study, we looked at 111 capital offenders who were sentenced to death. Okay, they're sentenced to death, and they're sentenced to death under a special issue in Texas where the jury made a finding of expectation that they would be violent in the future. The jury had to answer yes to the, to the issue, whether there's a probability the defendant would commit criminal acts of violence that would constitute a continuing threat to society. The jury's answered yes to that special issue, as well as others. The defendant was sentenced to death, 111 of them. Later on, because of errors that had occurred in their trials, they got relief from that death sentence, and their sentences were changed to life in prison. Now, we're, we're looking at their behavior in prison, averaging almost 10 years, 9.9 .9 years on death row, 
and then eight, averaging 8.4 years in the general prison population after they're on death row. Okay, so now you compare the two forms of life and death in prison. And so these guys, yes, they, these guys have a, a combined about 18 years in prison. Now, of course, they're still in prison. It's just when we lo looked at them, they'd been there averaging 18 years. And the comparison between the ones on death row and the ones in life without parole? In this, in, in this case, we're just looking at their absolute rates. Right. And if we come down here to the bottom of this chart and look at the most severe offenses or institutional offenses during those 18 years, none of the 111 killed anybody in prison. Zero. No homicides. Major or life-threatening injuries. Zero. Nobody committed an assault that sent somebody to the hospital with a major or life-threatening injury. Nobody. Zero. 111 guys. Juries predicted they would be violent in prison, violent in the future. Uh, none of that at all. Serious injuries. Serious injuries means a cut that required stitches, a broken bone, a concussion. Something that required more than first aid treatment. Doesn't mean you went to the hospital, but it did require more than first aid treatment. About one inmate in 12. 8%. 8.1% committed that in averaging 18 years in prison. That means 92% did not. Now about half of them were involved in at least a fist fight, 48%. And so again, this illustrates the more serious the violence is that we're forecasting, the dramatically less likely it is to occur. And this is all based on this study. But the, on this study of 111, and essentially this involved uh, you know, identifying these 111 offenders, sitting down with their pin packs, so their file records at the headquarters in the uh, Texas Department of Criminal Justice, and doing a hand search of the files and logging the disciplinaries that they okay. Uh, had. Okay. Um, but when you took this 111, it wasn't based on facts of the case or anything, it just had to do with sentences. Sentenced to death, okay. then got relief. Okay. But it didn't have anything to do with anybody knowing any of the knowledge of the actual facts of the case that got them there, right? For the purposes of this chart, we went on and studied the that as a factor. Okay. The next, the next thing I want you to talk about is what about if it was in fact a law enforcement officer that was the victim? Good question. So if we drill down into that data set for the 111 former death row guys, Members sentenced to death, got relief, general prison population. And then we have a comparison group of 1,757, 1,700, who were sentenced to life at their trials, at their capital trials, rather than death. So 111 sentenced to death, got relief, 1,700 plus who at their trials were sentenced to life. Now within that group, there of these 111, Within that 111 are six who had been convicted of killing a law enforcement officer. That was the nature of their capital offense. Six of the 111 killed a law enforcement officer. Now, we're looking at follow-up from 1974 to 2008, across 34 years of time. And they're at, they're, they range anywhere from having served four years in prison to 34 years. They're averaging about 18 years as we look at this whole sample. And so now we can look at how the 111 compare to the 1700, and we can also look at where the guys are who killed a law enforcement officer. And that's reflected in this bar chart on slide 21. Now the, in the turquoise, this, this green-blue column, those are the guys that were sentenced to life at entrance. The, the light blue are the former death row inmates, and this purple color are the ones that, that in their capital offense and sentenced to death were convicted of killing a law enforcement officer. Okay. And we got How did they compare? dangerous acts, assaults, and injurious assaults. And regardless of the severity, first, the former death sentenced inmates have lower rates of violence than the guys sentenced to life in the beginning. The guys who had been convicted of killing a law enforcement officer are far lower still, extremely low likelihood as compared to other offenders, other capital murderers in prison. Again, this is the importance of actually looking in the horse's mouth and counting the teeth. 
that rather than kind of trying to intuitively figure out whether somebody who killed a law enforcement officer is more likely to be violent in prison, let's actually look at the records of these offenders and compare them to each other. Okay. Um, what about the ones that were removed? The offenders that were taken off of death row, even though their juries had made a predictive assumption they would be violent in the future, in, in fact, their rates were uh, lower than those that were sentenced to life in the beginning. And you see, again, the more serious the violence, the dramatically less likely it is to occur. Okay, now, um, what about the ones Describe some more findings for us. Yes, ma'am. This is another study that looks at, at how capital offenders behave in prison. Remember earlier we talked about the 145 inmates that uh, were, were death penalty charged in federal court, then were allowed to plead to a life without parole sentence. That's what LWAP means, life without parole. Uh, or they were sentenced to LWAP by their juries. And we're going to look at different uh, severities of misconduct. They're, they've averaged serving six years in prison. We start with assaultive infractions. About one in five are involved in at least a fist fight. Uh, 20%. 9% are about one in 12, one in 11, are involved in a serious assault. Now in federal prison, a serious assault is called a 101 assault. And a 101 assault isn't one that necessarily causes serious injury, it's one that has that potential. So if I drop a padlock in a sock and I swing it at you and I miss, that's not a, 10, that's, that's a 101 assault even though no injury has occurred because serious injury could have occurred. So these aren't necessarily instances where someone was injured, it's an assault that had that potential. So 9% commit that, averaging six years, 91% do not. Assaults with moderate injuries, that's a single offender among these 145. Less than 1% committed an assault with moderate injuries. Assaults with major injuries, that's sending somebody to the hospital with a more serious injury, zero. Homicides, zero. Serious assaults on staff, zero. And what was the time frame of this study? Uh, this, is, this was published in 2008. We're looking at data beginning in about 1995 when the first federal offenders started going into the first death penalty sentencing under the, in the modern federal death penalty era, began in 1995. So you see that the absolute rate is low. Now let's look at their comparison. When we compare them to other inmates at the same level of security, in other words, these life without parole inmates are assigned to U.S. penitentiaries. So let's look and see how they do compared to other inmates in U.S. penitentiaries. And what we find is that they look just the same as the guys they're side by side with. Okay. So, so not only are they not very likely to be involved in violence and increasingly less likely as the severity increases, they're also not disproportionately likely to be violent in prison. Now how do we make this relevant to state court. Federal prisons and state prisons. People get confused on that. Can you just elaborate why would it be, would it be different or how can it be the same across the board? Sure. When we're, when we're looking at the nature of offenses that people get sentenced to death for, those are similar between state courts and federal court. It may be the only reason the person is federally prosecuted is because it happened in a national park instead of across the street on state property. And so it's only a matter of kind of geographic jurisdiction that may make a difference there. Okay, so These are, are, the prison, in, in, are the prison systems kind of the same across the board? What, yes, ma'am. The yes, ma'am. There are, uh, are very significant similarities in the way that prisons are operated, the, the procedures, uh, the sanctions, uh, the architecture, many are built by the same companies. And so as I'm in, in prisons around the United States, I am repeatedly impressed with how similar those prisons are. Now when we go to state prisons, 
the mix of who's in prison is also remarkably similar from state to state. In other words, about half the guys in any given State Department of Corrections are there for a serious violent felony. About 12 to 14 percent are there for a homicide or a, non, or a murder or a non-negligent homicide. And that mix of who's in prison stays pretty consistent as you look at prison systems across the country. And so there is an essential a scholarly agreement that there is broad generalization between different correctional jurisdictions. That what you find in Oregon often applies to Texas, to Louisiana, to Florida. Uh, and, and as we look at the data, the studies that we've done here in Florida, those data and findings are quite consistent with what we found in other jurisdictions. Okay, so is it all relevant just because people that, that get convicted of capital crimes and murder, they, they end up in prison, whether it's federal or state, it's, it's a human being, so the, the system is structured to keep them away from the community and be housed in that capacity. Yes, ma'am, that, that's correct. They, they, in both instances, are in, in all these jurisdictions, they've committed a murder. They've committed a murder that is deemed among the worst, which is why they were death penalty eligible right. to begin with. Okay. Uh, and now they're in prisons in high security, not lockdown, but high security, and those procedures are and, and situations are very consistent. Okay, so would your research and science be the same everywhere? It doesn't matter whether it's a state prison or a federal prison? That's been what we've identified. Okay. All right. The way you test that is to do research in lots of different jurisdictions, which is what we've done and demonstrated that consistency uh, across systems. Okay, what about the long tenure in, in prison? How is that effective? Uh, this is another study looking at long sentenced inmates. These in Oregon, uh, they've averaged 15 years in prison, 65 sentenced to life, and 50 sentenced to death. Uh, again, very similar results in terms of, uh, in this study, a single inmate killed another inmate. Nobody got sent to the hospital, a life-threatening uh, injury. A single inmate committed an assault that uh, was going to the hospital with a serious injury. So very similar kinds of findings in terms of very low rates of serious violence, even though these individuals have been convicted of capital murder. Okay. Have you done any studies on actual um, inmates that you gave the risk assessment to, like yes. you did Eric? Yes, ma'am, I have. Uh, what, what was your finding? This is a this is follow up of cases where I did an evaluation and filed a report, or actually came and testified about an inmate's likelihood of violence in prison, and this reflects the follow up of 73 cases. Now, I, I at the point we had done this study, I'd actually testified or done risk assessments in 44 federal capital cases. We got the results on 43 of them, one inmates in like a federal witness protection program. And so his files are unavailable. He isn't even under his own name anymore. So I couldn't get him. I've done about 120 risk assessments in state capital cases, and, but only 30 cases would the prison system provide us the disciplinary follow-up. They said there were privacy reasons for the others. So we got virtually all of the federal only 25% of the state for a total of 73 cases. At the point we did this study, they'd averaged about four and a half years in prison. 59% of them had been, had been sentenced to capital life at their trials, and 41% had received a death sentence. Okay, so how'd they do? Uh, about one in eight, 12.3% were involved in at least a fist fight. A single inmate was cited for a 101A assault. That's an attempted serious assault. Now remember, a lock and a sock that misses is a 101. So a 101A is something less than that. Now in this instance, the, we were provided with all of these disciplinary infractions, the, the, the write-ups of them, except this one. And the Bureau of Prisons said they had lost that write-up. So I can't drill down into it to identify, well, just exactly what did that 101A consist of? Um, so 12% in at least a fist fight. A single inmate was involved in a 101A. 
There were no assaults with moderate injuries, no assaults with major injuries, no homicides in prison, no serious assaults on staff, zero. Now, if you treated this as, uh, as an error, if you said, well, Dr. Cunningham, there was one who engaged in serious violence in prison, then you would say that, that these assessments were correct 98.5% of the time. Now, in fact, I never say it can't happen. I describe that it's very unlikely. And so 1.4% is very unlikely. It's kind of like if a physician says, you have a 1 in 100 chance of a heart attack this year. If you have a heart attack, he wasn't wrong. We've got to look at 99 others to see whether that probability held or not. Uh, but in any case, what we observe is that assessments finding a very low likelihood enjoy an extraordinary accuracy. Remember our 111, the jurors that, that anticipated there would be serious violence? No homicides, no hospital admissions, that kind of thing. If we looked at their outcomes based on those most serious uh, uh, assaultive injuries, those juries were wrong 95, 98, 100% of the time, depending on the severity of the violence we looked at. So one of the conclusions here is that assessments resulting in, in estimates of a very low likelihood of serious violence are going to be right almost all the time. Okay, now has the Department of Justice weighed in on this issue? Yes, they have. Uh, th these are conclusions of the U.S. Department of Justice that were published back in the early 90s. That's before our research group began to do our own large-scale res research on rates and correlates of violence. But even back then, based on the more limited research and correctional experience that they had at that time, you know, almost 25 years ago, here's what they were concluding even then. Past violence in the community is not strongly or consistently associated with prison violence. Current offense, prior convictions, and escape history are only weakly associated with prison misconduct. Severity of the offense is not a good predictor of prison adjustment. Okay, is there other research that confirms this counterintuitive finding that homicide offenders are not violent, are not violent in prison? Or, have, or at least are very unlikely to be violent uh, in prison. Yes, ma'am, this is uh, research looking at 35,000 inmates uh, in the Oregon Department of Corrections over a 12-year period of time, 1996 to 2008. It's research the data that's collected by Dr. Uh, Tom Reedy and John Sorensen and I. And again, looking at three different severities of assaultive infractions, serious violations, assaultive violations, and serious assaultive violations. The higher the bar is, the greater the percentage of inmates involved. And then we've got the different types. Yellow is homicide offenders. This darkest purple-blue is property. The next shade of purple is assault. And the lightest is robbery. We're, of course, interested in how do those yellow homicide offenders occur. And we find that they have rates of violence, or assault and misconduct, that are equal or lower than the other guys they're side by side with. Uh, in most categories. And you're talking about people that are in for other crimes? That's right. So the, the yellow are individuals who are in prison for a homicide. That's their most serious offense of conviction. The dark purple are offenders who are in prison for a property crime. Burglary, fraud, that kind of thing. The uh, somewhat darker purple, those are people in prison for an assault. And the lightest color are individuals who are in prison convicted of a robbery. So this gives you some comparison of what homicide offenders look like in terms of their likelihood of violence. Again, counterintuitive if we were thinking killing somebody has crossed a threshold that means you're going to be much more likely to commit violence in the future in prison. But that's not what the study shows. It's not what the study shows. Okay. Uh, what next factor can we consider on there? The next factor is that he would be serving a life without parole sentence. Okay. Did you do any type of studies on comparatives on that? Uh, yes, ma'am. Remember the Potosi unit that we looked at earlier on that logistic regression analysis? Well, this is simply describing that, that 
holding other factors constant. Those guys serving life without parole were about half as likely to be involved in prison misconduct. Now, we've just published, or just had accepted, it's in press. This means the scientific journal has sent it through peer review, revised, now it's just awaiting physical printing. It's in press. It's the, it's the continuation of this study. This study was based on, on 11 years, and now we're following that up with almost 25 years of follow-up of the Potosi unit and how our des mainstream descendants inmates are doing and how the life without parole inmates are doing. And in the follow-up, those life without parole inmates continue to have very low rates of violence. But now in the, more re the modern era, comparing them to other inmates, they look like the other inmates instead of being half as likely. Now, it isn't that they've gotten worse. It was a feature of the Potosi Correctional Center in the first study that inmates who were getting in trouble in prison were being sent there. And so you had a population that was characterized more by troublemakers. Now they're spreading those people throughout the system. They aren't just sent to Potosi. And so now those life without parole inmates look like other longer sentence inmates that they're side by side with. Is there any other research? Yes, ma'am. This is a study that we did here in Florida uh, that looks at a total of 9,000 inmates. That includes almost 1,900 that were, are serving life without parole, almost 2,000 that are serving 30 years or more, and over 5,000 that are serving 10 to 29 years. And what we found here in Florida is very similar to our most recent data out of Potosi. And that is that the inmates that are serving life without parole look like other long-term inmates. They're better than the guys serving 10 to 20. They're not quite as good as the guys serving 30 years or more, but the differences are very small. But in fact, only one in 200, half a percent, of those LWAP inmates committed an assault resulting in serious injury during the six-year period of the study. Across six years, one in 200 committed that kind of assault. Tells you again how unlikely uh, that is and how much these guys look like other long-term inmates. Now, these data are also very counterintuitive because what you'd intuitively think is that somebody who's serving life without parole has nothing to lose. There's no parole incentive. And is that the case? In fact, it's not. When we actually study these offenders, what we're finding is they look like other long-term inmates. They're not behaving like they have nothing to lose. Now, the explanation for this is, is one that was uh, uh, described by Timothy Flanagan, Dr. Timothy Flanagan, in his doctoral dissertation, uh, subsequently published. He went on to be the director of the Bureau of Justice Statistics. And Flanagan did his dissertation on long-sentenced inmates. And what he found is that long-sentenced inmates take a different response to doing time. Have you prepared a model? And it's, well, it's, the, it's the idea, let me describe and then I'll move to the model. It's the idea that the, the longer you're going to be in prison, the more powerful the incentives are. What I mean by that? Well, if I'm going to be eating institutional food from now on, my ability to purchase a package of potato chips or a can of beans becomes extremely important. I can be a bad actor and spend the rest of my life locked down in a walk-in closet. Or I can go along with the program and come out and have a job to do that helps the time pass and gives me a sense of productivity. The longer I'm going to be in prison, the more powerful those small incentives become. And so it isn't so much that the inmate has gotten suddenly rehabilitated, it's that this inmate is motivated not to make prison any more horrible on himself than it has to be. And so rather than having less to lose, these offenders have more to lose because this is where they're going to be for decades or perhaps from now on. Because there is no parole. There is no parole. That's right. Can you demonstrate it for us? So the, the, the model that, that you're inquiring about that is that as we understand the occurrence of violence, violence is almost never a function of just the person. It's almost never just about this person. Instead, it's a person who is in an in interaction in a particular context. And it's out of that whole matrix that you get violence. Person, interaction, context. Now, when you put somebody in prison, now you have an inmate interacting with other inmates and vigilant staff. Of course, there's a different victim pool 
Now this is very important when we look at other inmates because in the community I can tell myself that I'm going to be violent and I'll never be caught or this victim will never know who did this. But in prison there's not anything that you do that the victim doesn't know who you are. And, now, and he's in prison for a reason. And now you have to deal with him and his friends and his cousins who you don't even know from now on. It's a very different kind of mix. Or staff, vigilant, well-trained staff, who you're also going to have to deal with from now on in a very restrictive context. Now, the effect of this is essentially to form a barrier that blocks the occurrence of the most serious violence. So remember that we said about 50% of the people in prison are there for a serious violent felony. 12 to 14 percent are there for killing someone, a non-negligent homicide or a murder. And yet the rate of, of homicide in prisons is about four per hundred thousand inmates per year. Four per hundred thousand inmates per year. Now if you were to demographically match those people in terms of age and that kind of thing with the open community, that rate in the open community is over 30 per hundred thousand per year. In other words, the rate of homicide in prison is, is about one-eighth that of a demographically matched group in the open community. Why is that? Well, because prison works. Because the restrictive context uh, and the structure of prison works to contain the most serious violence, even among offenders who had shown that, that proclivity, that, uh, that capacity to be violent in the open community. What is one of the things, key things that assist the prisons to work, to work when you take the, the person convicted of the capital crime out of the community? What well, are you taking away from Well, them? there are a number of things. You are, uh, you are removing their access to high lethality weapons like handguns. Uh, they may be able to use drugs or alcohol in prison, but not to the extent that they could maintain a habit on the outside. You have immediate consequences that can be brought to bear. And you can, you can ratchet up their security. In other words, the prisons are responding dynamically to the inmate. And so if the inmate communicates that he needs more structure and consequences, then they clamp down and provide that. And so they're always assessing what level of security needs to be brought to bear on any particular uh, inmate. And is that always based on their behavior? based on the inmate's behavior and based on the correctional assessment. In other words, the correctional system can act preemptively if they have reason to believe this person is disproportionately at risk of violence. If their intelligence identifies that they're a member of a bona fide prison gang, they can lock them down preemptively. They don't have to wait for something to occur. Now, they can't just throw away the key. They're going to have to have periodic internal review of whether that's still indicated but the prisons can act preemptively to bring additional security to bear. Okay. Uh, what's the next factor pointing to Paris? The next factor is that he uh, is going to be an inmate in the Florida Department of Corrections. Do we have any studies in Florida? Yes, ma'am. Let me. We've been looking at some of those, but let me describe this large-scale study that I spoke of earlier in my testimony. This is a study that I did with Dr. John Sorensen where we looked at over 51,000 inmates here in the Florida Department of Corrections. And if we break that out, that included 5,010 that had been convicted of first-degree murder, 11, over 11,000 that had been convicted of a property offense, total of over 51,000 inmates. Now, we're looking at their behavior during a single year. This is the year 2003. And this is based on the Florida Department of Corrections providing us with their statistical database, which we could then go in and mine to understand different relationships and, and features of their experience. So let's see how they did. If we're looking at total violations, that's a disciplinary infraction for anything, all the way from not making your bed to an assault. And in any given year, about one in three, 35% of our first-degree murderers get a disciplinary ticket for something. But that's less than the property offenders. They had 48% are all inmates in general 44.8%. So one of our first conclusions is that first, people get written up pretty regularly in prison for some kind of disciplinary infraction, number one. And number two, generally our murderers are getting in trouble less often than other folks are. 
the general adjustment is better. When we go out to potentially violent misconduct, that's 8.8% of the first degree murderers were involved in potentially violent misconduct. That's an assault of any severity, threat against staff, weapons contraband, that kind of thing. But holding all of their factors constant, that's 20% less than the property offenders and all of inmates. So they're also involved less in potentially violent misconduct. Once we get out to assaults, or assaults with injuries, or assaults with serious injuries, the murderers look just like the other inmates. So the severity of the offense wasn't telling us who's going to be violent in prison. Now we looked at this and we said, wait a minute, the murderers have probably been in prison longer. Maybe that accounts for why their rates are not higher. So we went back into the data set and we looked at everybody that came to prison in 2002 and then served all of 2003. So we controlled for how long they'd been in prison. And the murderers looked just like the other inmates. And we said, wait a minute, the murderers probably went to a higher level of custody. They went to close custody. Now that doesn't mean that they're locked down in solitary. It means they go to secure perimeter facilities. So in Florida, there's external security and then there's internal security. External security is the double perimeter fences, gun towers, that kind of thing. It's about how escape-proof the place is. Internal security may range all the way from being locked down in a cell by yourself to being in a dorm. And so you could have a dorm housing inside a secure perimeter facility. Two different types, internal security, external security. So we looked at everybody that came to prison the year before and went to close custody where the murderers are. And the murderers looked just like everybody else. So no matter how we sliced and diced it to try to control for these factors, the conclusion we keep coming back to based on the data is that the murderers generally are better adjusted in terms of disciplinaries and look just like other inmates in terms of assaults. Okay, doctor. Can, uh, earlier you did reference a more serious to prison violence, the less likely it is to occur. Can you tell me if the findings are consistent with that? Yes, ma'am. Let me describe that in terms of our first-degree murderers. 35% get a disciplinary ticket for something in that year. 8.9%, about 1 in 11 or 12, are involved in a potentially violent assault. 1 in 40 in an assault. 1 in 200 in an assault with injury. 1 in 500 an assault with serious injury. 1 in 500 in a year. Now, you know, if you've been watching Oz or on HBO or Lock Up or that kind of thing, the intuitive sense that you have is that people are being stabbed up in prison all the time. And in fact, what we see here in Florida and, and most jurisdictions is that, that is very rare that you're talking about 1 in 500 inmates annually. Okay, do you have any type of model that you can use and utilize to illustrate why offenders are such risks that are in the community that are not when they get to prison? All right, yes, ma'am. Typically, as we look at, at persons that commit murder, commit capital murder, there are many factors that have, are present that it put them at risk for violence in the community. Now, when they go to prison, again, it isn't like all of those go away. We don't have access to high lethality weapons, can't have the same degree of substance abuse that you did. But mostly the reason that prison works so well to contain violence is we've stacked up the other side of the scale with security and structure and staff and confinement and consequences. And that holds individuals in check who were at significant risk of violence in the open community. Okay, and how can you summarize all of this? We can summarize where we've been is looking at, at these data. Rates of, vi of serious violence among capital inmates in the general prison population are extremely low. That's number one. Number two, the more severe the projected violence, the increasingly remote its occurrence. <coughs> number three, the seriousness of the offense of conviction, what sent this person to prison, does not predict prison violence. And finally, the older the inmate, the lower the rates of disciplinary misconduct and violence. Okay, can you go ahead and relate them to Aris? So if we take these data and we particularize it to Aris Tisdale, 
we begin this with relative to group rates. Those are our anchoring points. All these data that we've looked at about the frequency of different severities of violence and that kind of thing, those are the anchoring points for our assessment of Aris Tisdale. And the, a, a basic uh, principle of risk assessment is that the further you stray from the base rates, well, what are the, base rates? the base rates are the batting average. Okay. So when we saw that this happens in one inmate in 500, that's a base rate. When we said among these uh, capital offenders that, uh, that there, the incidence of homicide is anywhere from non-existent to less than one in a hundred across decades in prison, that's the base rate. Uh, when we said that the incidence of the tragedy of a correctional officer being killed is about one per million inmates per year, that's the base rate. So you want to keep that that rate in mind, and then you're going to talk about factors from the research that would raise or lower that individual's risk. Okay, and the factors you put in are heiresses. And they're heiresses. Now, the reason I would anchor this to group rates is, let's say that, for example, that we found that the likelihood of a serious assault across decades, assault with serious injury, is 1%. And we have a, a factor that triples the risk. Well, now where are we? 3%. So we're still exceedingly unlikely. There's still a 97% likelihood that it won't happen. And so that's why you have to keep in mind that base rate. Because then even if I'm saying this doubles it, this triples it, it may still only make it just slightly less improbable. All right, so as we look at, at Aris Tisdale, I found no empirically demonstrated factors that would raise his risk relative to the base rate. We do have some factors that are present that decrease his risk relative to the base rate. His age, his pattern in con conduct in custody up to now, his AA degree, his continued contact with community members. Those are all factors that would modestly reduce his risk relative to the group as a whole. Okay, so using an actuarial risk model from one of your studies, where would Eris fall as far as the risk assessment relative to other people? So when you describe an actuarial model, what that means is, in, as we have examined these rates of violence and the factors that are associated with it, that was the first step. Then the next step is to build statistical models that, uh, that, that let us group those factors together so that we can summarize them. Not, not unlike what the insurance company does, 16-year-old male unmarried drivers. See, they, they, they've aggregated, they've brought those factors together to then study their outcomes. And that's what we did with, uh, with, with a number of our research studies, is that we built predictive models or actuarial models based on the findings. This first one is one that was, was built from 13,341 offenders admitted to the Florida Department of Corrections. And we're looking at their conduct the first year in custody. And as we would plug the factors of, of Eris that match that group, he is in the best 20% of risk classification. In that best 20%, 4.5% engaged in potentially violent misconduct. Remember that's threat against staff, weapons contraband, or a fist fight, or an assault of any severity. 4.5%. Now the next one uh, is an actuarial model that was, was designed from 136 capital offenders, death penalty charged, who were then sentenced to life sentences in Texas. And we're tracking them, or retrospectively looking back on their records, anywhere from six to 40 months in prison. They're averaging just over two years in prison. We identified three risk groups, and inmates matching his characteristics were in the best three risk groups. And that best of the three risk groups, nobody committed an assault, zero. Nobody committed an assault with serious injury, zero. And that was the study of 40 months study? The, this looked at folks who had been in, in prison as long as the first 40 months, as short as six months, 136, they were sentenced to life sentences uh, after being death penalty charged. Okay, and where does Harris fall? 
on capital? He's in the best of the three risk groups. Okay. And the model that we built from these data. And uh, in that group, there were no assaults while they were in prison during that first kind of critically important period. Uh, remember our study of the 111 capital <laughs> offenders sentenced to death, and they got locked in there, got relief from that sentence, now they're in the general prison population. Again, we developed three risk classifications based on their characteristics. And again, Eris Tisdale is in the best of the three groups. In the group that he belongs to, there were no serious assaults among offenders who had those characteristics, capital offenders who had those characteristics, across averaging 18 years in prison. So to say, the risk of violence in somebody like Aaron's with his risk factors is lower. It's lower. But so this is, not only is it low, but as we would compare him to other people who've been death penalty charged okay. and divide them into three risk groups based on characteristics about them that were predictive, that, that were associated with a greater or lesser incidence of violence during 18 years in prison. Okay. Do you have any other actuarial data that you can compare to? Uh, yes, ma'am. This is, uh, is based, again, on data out of the Florida Department of Corrections. Remember, our last one looked at 13,000 who were just coming into prison for any offense, and now they're in the general prison population. And the, 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 the data that we have here, we're only looking at inmates in close custody at the same security level, 24,000. And this is Florida. This is Florida, based on the calendar year 2003. And what are the characteristics that we're looking at? Well, in, in the match group, we're talking about inmates aged 26 to 30 who have been convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life without parole with above-average educational equivalency, in other words, with at least a high school education level, who have not been to prison before and have no gang affiliation. Now, which is the match group to Eris. That's the match group to Eris in terms of risk predictive characteristics. There are 84 offenders in close custody out of okay, the 24,000. Close, close custody is a secure perimeter facility. In other words, inmates that are sentenced to very long prison terms or life without parole are identified as perhaps being more motivated to escape. And so they are then put in prisons that have more secure perimeters that are more escape-proof. Now, it doesn't mean, though, that they're going to be more violent in prison, so within that close custody facility, they might be in a dorm where they have open access to other inmates. So the risk is what, how, how tight do we need to make the security so they never get out? But on in, the inside, they may not require any particular special confinement. And why would it be relevant in Harris's case to compare them? Because he will go to close custody if sentenced to life without parole because of the, the length of the sentence. So let's look at him compared to other close custody inmates and, and particularly to those in close custody who match his characteristics. And when we do that, we see the bar chart on slide 45. These are our percentages of inmates involved on this vertical axis. And then the nature of the severity of the assaults uh, are across that horizontal axis. Okay, now where is Eris? Eris is in this match group here. This blue group, base rate, that's the rate of, of mis this assaultive misconduct among the 24,000. So that's that 24,000 in close custody. The 84 guys that match him on those characteristics that we talked about, that's this darker bluish purple. And whether we're talking about dangerous acts, 10% of the match group committed that, while 14% of the other guys in close custody did. They're about, you know, about a third less likely. When we move to assaults, it's very similar. 4.5% of the match group, 3.5% of the, I mean, 4.5% of the 24,000 in general, 3.57% of the match group. This could be like a fight, this fight. When we get to injurious assaults, the match group was less than 1% among the 24,000. Nobody, I'm sorry, the base rate among the 24,000 was less than 1%. The 84 in the match group, nobody 
committed an injurious assault in that year. Can you give us any other comparisons? Uh, this is uh, based on 21,000, almost 21,000 inmates serving a year or more in the Oregon Department of Corrections. This time our match group are murderers, age 28 or older, with a high school degree or equivalent, no prior prison term. 75 guys fit those characteristics out of the 20,997. As we would compare them, the, the 20,000 are in this blue color and the match group are in the red color. The match group has lower rates until we get out to violent acts, then they're, they're somewhat more likely. But again, we're talking about the rate per 1,000. And so the match group has about 10 per 1,000. I'm sorry, the, the 21,000 have about 10 per 1,000. Uh, the match group to him, this red, are at about 17 per 1,000. So again, it's extremely unlikely, but they were just somewhat more likely on the most is more violent eyes. Okay, are there any mechanisms available in the Florida State Prison to control um, violence and disruptive inmates? Yes, ma'am, they are. These are characteristics that the Florida Department of Corrections shares with all correctional departments, is they would bring interventions to bear uh, to prevent violence or to respond to it if it occurs, to deter it from happening uh, further. There's treatment, discipline, that can almost immediately brought to bear to take things away that are important to the inmate, that make his time in prison much more uncomfortable. Or they can respond by ratcheting up the security, by locking this individual down and subjecting them to even greater supervision and restriction of activity. And so treatment, discipline, and security uh, can be brought to bear. So the, the prison system is not, uh, is not impotent or helpless to respond to inmates. They have all kinds of capabilities that can be brought to bear uh, to deter inmates and to uh, provide uh, structure and essentially quarantine to those that demonstrate they require that. And how did, what does this mean for Eris? Well, this means that Eris's likelihood of serious violence in prison is extremely low. Based on the factors you've explained? Based on the factors I've described. Should the Florida Department of Corrections assess him and come to a different conclusion, then they have restrictions that they can bring to bear preemptively. Or should he get to prison and begin to act out, then they can lock him down. And so the, 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 the probability of this, uh, of severe violence, is extremely low. And there are consequences and responses that the prison system can make, preventively or after the fact, should uh, there be incidents. But based on the factors that he possessed for himself, you, the predictive results are low. That's correct. correct. Based on, on his characteristics in a prison setting. Okay. In a prison setting. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, okay. Now, um, Dr. Cunningham, um, as you said earlier, we, we retained you. Yes, ma'am. Right. Um, how much of your profession is based on expert testimony? Um, yeah, a, a relatively small percentage on testimony. My entire income, uh, except for a little bit of royalties, is derived from providing evaluations in court-related matters. Uh, that, you know, that's, that's interviewing and reviewing records and writing reports and that kind of thing. Uh, so I spend a lot of time doing that, but a relatively little time on the stand. So today I will have been here on the stand for just a few hours, which is a very small part of the time that I've worked in this case. So all of my uh, income is derived from court-related activities, but only a very small part of it from actually appearing in court. Okay. So what are you putting in charge? My fee uh, in this case is $360 per hour. And is that discounted in Yes, ma'am, my fee, uh, because this is a publicly retained case, uh, the fee is lower. If, the, if this were privately retained, if this was being paid, uh, if, if Eris Tisdale was very wealthy and was paying for his own defense rather than the, this being publicly funded, then the rate would be $420 per hour. Okay. 
Uh, as of starting over here this morning, uh, just over 80 hours. Now, some people would say that being paid for your presentation here today, that you would have a bias towards giving us what we want to hear and presenting to this jury what um, would be positive to the defense, not the state. Uh, can you explain whether that's true or not? Well, yes, ma'am. Let me clarify that I'm I'm being paid for my time, not my testimony. And you could call me today or not, depending on what you thought about the uh, the risk assessment uh, that I did. Um, the 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 presence of uh, being paid is always a potential source of bias, um, and and one that an expert would need to be aware of. Because this testimony is uh, so clearly based on research data, there's not a lot of subjectivity to it. The numbers are what they are. And so it's not as if there are 10 other studies that say something else and these are the ones that I've selected. This is the major research uh, in the field and the findings of it are very consistent. Um, one of the advantages that I have is because I practice nationally, in other words, I'm, I'm licensed in 20 states and, and work all over the United States. Uh, it, it doesn't affect my bottom line very much whether I ever come back to uh, this county again or not. Because there are demands for my services in, in other jurisdictions uh, and there's more work that I can do than I can get to. And so I guess I'm kind of like, in, in this sense, that your heart surgeon may be very well paid, makes a, a, a great income. You, you kind of want him to have a good income because you'd like for him to make a decision about your heart surgery based on your condition, not whether he needs to make his house payment this month. And so that, that's kind of where I am as well, that I, I, I make a good living that derives from all over the place. There are more surgeries to do than I can get to. And so that, that much reduces uh, the, the pressure that I would have on me that, gee, if I make the public defender's office unhappy or I make the prosecutor's office unhappy and I'm local, I live here, well now what am I going to do for a forensic practice? I'm not in that, uh, uh, that situation, which is uh, uh, an advantage of being both very busy and having a national practice. Okay, and do you have a view on the death penalty? No, ma'am. I, I don't have an advocacy position on the death penalty. I have lots of views about uh, the importance that these proceedings be scientifically informed and reliable and that kind of thing. I have, I have views about the importance of issues being well illuminated to juries, but I don't have an advocacy position about uh, whether a jurisdiction has a death penalty or not. Okay, and would you let that interfere with your opinion in your research and data? Well, no, ma'am. I would accept a retention if requested by the state, just like I would if it was requested by the defense, and I would do the same analysis that I've done here, and I would come and report the same findings. Okay. Well, do you ever get hired by the state? Uh, I have in non-capital cases. The state has never retained me in a capital case. And why is that? Uh, well... Objection. Right, I'll overlook objection if you know, Doctor. Well, on the most practical level, the phone doesn't ring. They don't call me. Um, the, the, uh, the, the reasons for that are pretty obvious. Uh, the data that you've seen on uh, the, the extremely low frequency of violence among capital offenders in prison, uh, I'm not likely to be called by the state to present those data. That data is simply more helpful to the defense. Uh, the data is also very clear uh, that childhood matters and is profoundly formative in many aspects of life, including who's involved in crime and serious crime. Uh, and, and there is an extensive body of research about that uh, that I'm a student of. I haven't contributed to it in the same way I have the violence risk assessment, but I'm a student of it. have testified about it, written about it in scholarly publications. Uh, I will never be called to present that data. And so in that sense, I'm like a researcher that studied the relationship between cigarette smoking and cancer and found there to be a relationship. I'll never be called by the tobacco companies. 
not because I have a bias about it, but simply because that's what the data says. Anybody need to use the restroom over there? Okay, all right. Okay, all I need is one. Uh, I'll have you all step in the jury room. We'll have you back shortly. Please bear with us. Just a quick restroom break. If y'all need to go, please go. Go off the record a minute. 